Thank you all for joining us. We're going to give it a few minutes for everyone to get in the room, and then we're going to kick this off. Don't want to sound like a broken record, but I realize people are still coming in. So we're just giving it a minute and then we're going to kick this off once we get everyone into the webinar and ready to go. Daniel, you made me feel guilty. I wore my glasses today because you. <laughs> It was a toss up, but I, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm cooked without him, though. <laughs> See, I'm farsighted. So it's just after too long, then I'll get a headache. But I figured for the for the vibe we're going for all in the name of Brick City Homecoming. All right, let's just give it about 30 more seconds and then we will kick it off. All right, looks like everyone should be in the room right now. So why don't we get started? Hi everyone, welcome to one of today's Tiger Alumni Week webinars, sustaining the coffee industry one cup at a time. I'm Dan Case, I am a senior staff assistant in the University Advancement Division here at RIT. And tonight I'm going to be your moderator. And I'm personally very excited because I love the topic we're gonna to talk about, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Before I do that though, I do wanna go over a few housekeeping points. Y'all have uh, entered this room in mute mode, so you won't be able to verbally ask questions, but we definitely want you to answer or to ask them, but you can do so just entering them in the Q&A box at any point throughout the evening. We're gonna make every effort to address your comments and questions throughout the webinar. And throughout, you may have gotten a notification already that it will be recorded. Uh, we're doing that so that we can make the presentation available in the coming weeks. So we're going to send a communication with how to access those recordings and also we're going to post it on our website. If at any point tonight you do have any technical questions, uh, feel free to type those in the chat box as well. Uh, and we're going to do our best to get you the appropriate answers and make sure that everything runs as smoothly as possible. I would like to thank our premier sponsor, Sharp Notions, as well as our Tiger sponsor, Rochester Regional Health, for helping make this week's programming possible. We would also like to uh, thank our lovely Access Services team uh, for helping with this webinar, making it accessible for all of our alumni. Uh, Real-time captioning is available within the webinar, and our interpreters are going to be spotlighted during the presentation. I also do want to let you know how grateful we are to all members of the RIT family who made a gift yesterday on War Day. Uh, these gifts do have a direct and immediate impact on our students. And if you haven't made a gift yet, we would love for you to still do so. There still is time. You can visit rit.edu slash roar and your gift will be counted towards that War Day total. All right. Now that we have done our housekeeping, it's time to get on to this session. I am so excited to welcome Major Cohen who is going to present Sustaining the Coffee Industry One Cup at a Time. D. Major Cohen is a coffee lover who has enjoyed a dream realized. A teacher of photography and film at the high school level for 20 years, he grew up in a time when coffee went from a poor quality, inexpensive commodity to a ubiquitous and often delicious inexpensive luxury. Major's second career as a coffee educator for Starbucks brought his passion for teaching and coffee into alignment for more than 25 years. His work for Starbucks began in 1995 as a barista, moving forward into five operations positions within eight years before he was invited to move to the Seattle headquarters and join the coffee team there. Over the next 17 years, Major was a part of some of Starbucks' most innovative efforts, and he traveled extensively in Asia as a coffee educator and brand ambassador in his final years there. 
Although recently retired from Starbucks, Major continues to be involved with coffee education as an authorized specialty coffee association trainer, or AST to make it a little bit easier for us. And he is writing his first book, Coffee for Dummies, which is expected to be published in 2021. I know that I am excited for tonight's presentation. I'm sure you are too. So Major, I'm not gonna keep taking up your time. Thank you so much for joining us. The audience is all yours. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here and uh, I am uh, humbled uh, and uh, have been, as I've been preparing, reflecting a great deal on uh, what a great opportunity this is uh, and certainly unique for me uh, to be with all of you. Uh, I have to say up front that I wish that we were all together in person because we could be having coffee and uh, Although that's not going to be possible, uh, I, uh, I do hope that uh, someday we will be together in person uh, because I think that uh, coffee and people together is, uh, is an amazingly, uh, amazingly powerful, powerful entity. At any rate, uh, I'm going to be talking for probably the next 45 minutes. Uh, Anyone on the call who knows me well, and there are some friends that have decided to call in today, uh, knows that I'm a man of many words. And uh, the fact that I have an hour time limit uh, is going to be uh, limiting for me. Uh, and uh, I'm going to do my best to, uh, to say what I'd like to say and to share what I'd like to share with you all, uh, given uh, the things that I, I have been asked or charged with talking about sustainability and coffee. And I, I'm going to try to bring it home in time for us to have some time to answer questions and dialogue together if we can do that. Uh, what I'm going to try to do in this time that we're together uh, is to first uh, ground you a little bit in, in where I'm coming from, uh, although uh, Daniel has done a great job. And, I, and as I said, I'm quite humbled by all that, <laughs> all that he shared about me. Uh, and uh, he, he established really an expertise that I'm uh, super proud of, but uh, I have to tell you something right off the start here because I think it's important. Um, and that is that uh, as expert or as uh, experienced as I might be in coffee, uh, it's important for you to understand that <laughs> I'm, really, uh, I'm really an expert consumer. Uh, I have loved coffee for as long as I have been enjoying beverages. And uh, in fact, uh, my mother used to share that as a child, I asked for coffee and uh, I was always glad to get a glass of milk with a few drops of coffee in it. And uh, I have uh, I've carried that love for coffee through my entire life. Uh, I laughed a little bit thinking back to the time that I was at RIT in the 1970s uh, late 1960s, early 70s, uh, because quite honestly, uh, in the little bit that I'm going to share, <laughs> uh, helping you guys understand what specialty coffee is and where it came from, I, I realize now that the coffee that I had while I was at RIT was quite abysmal. Uh, and uh, I, I liked it nonetheless and enjoyed the caffeine that it gave me, but it really wasn't very good yet. And uh, so as a consumer, what I'm gonna do, I hope, is to establish an interesting responsibility that, that, <laughs> that we all have. Anyone who's listening, who's on today, who's a coffee drinker, and I'm guessing there's quite a few of you, uh, we have a shared responsibility. In order to have you understand that responsibility, I'm gonna talk about the history of this business that is coffee. Uh, and uh, I'm, again, uh, I laugh about the fact that I've been alive through all of it. Uh, I, was, uh, I was a young guy drinking coffee in the earliest days and I've, I've been drinking coffee through what I'm gonna share with you is the history of specialty coffee because it's not that, not that old or it's real old depending on how you're looking at me, whether I'm looking old or I'm looking less than old. At any rate, uh, when I give you that history, uh, you'll have an understanding of that commitment that I'm talking about and you'll certainly understand what has driven today's business to become the business that it is. And then I'm gonna try to help you approach that responsibility by sharing three companies that, that mean a lot to me as a coffee lover 
And uh, I've picked these companies because one of them represents in the world of coffee, perhaps a hundred to a thousand pounds of coffee purchased a year as a business. And one of them represents a company that buys thousands of pounds a year. And the third company where I worked for more than 25 and a half years is currently buying 600 million pounds of coffee a year. And so I wanted to try to give you some sense of the scale uh, that the industry encompasses. And uh, that will probably help you in terms of your own approach in this shared responsibility that we have. And so at the end of that, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we can all do next and, and what you might wanna look for as you kind of head into your next coffee experience, which I hope overriding all of the things that I just shared that I'm gonna to try to do. I hope that after this time with me, you never approach a coffee the same way again. Uh, that would be a wonderful accomplishment if you're thinking differently about your coffee, wherever you get it, whatever it is, I hope that you think a little differently about it. And uh, that, would be, that would be a wonderful success if, if we measure the success. And so I'm gonna take a minute and I'm gonna get my screen up because I do have, uh, I do have a deck that I wanna try to speak to. And I'm gonna share my screen, boom. And I'm gonna get my Okay, and that is it. Okay, good. And uh, I'm hoping that you guys can see the screen. I can't see any little pictures of anything other than this screen. So uh, I don't know if I did that correctly or not. Dan, can you see my deck? I cannot. Okay. Well, then that's a problem. Let's go back to this share screen. Let me see if I can view. Well, it certainly worked very well at the very beginning. But it's not sharing now, huh? Not yet. So how many screens do you have physically? Do you have one screen? I have one screen, yep. OK. Um, are you on a Mac? No, I'm on a, uh, I'm not. I'm on a ThinkPad. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to go up to the top and we're going to hit Start Presentation, that little button. Uh, start the presentation from the beginning. Oh, you mean in my in my PowerPoint? Okay, that yeah, I yeah. just yeah I just did that. And um, now we're gonna click Alt Tab. So you're gonna find your Alt button and your Tab button on your keyboard and hit them at the same time. Okay. Now we're gonna click the Share Screen button. Okay, is that I can't access? Is it is one of the icons at the bottom? Uh, yeah, it should. When you're on your Zoom page, it should be one of the icons on the bottom of the Zoom page. Can you okay, see? Okay, but that? I don't have. When I click what you just asked me to click, I don't have the Zoom page anymore. Okay. What are you? What are you seeing? I'm seeing small icons. Okay. You're gonna go until you're gonna click it until you are the one that says Zoom is selected, and then you're gonna let go of that combo. I don't have that. Okay. Um, Boom. Okay. Well, I, let's see. What if I, what if I kick it down? All right. I still have, you all should know that we did rehearse this before you came on. So share computer sound, optimize screen sharing for video clip. So now I'm looking at select a window that I want to share. So now a screen is the one I want to share. Uh, yeah. Okay. It or if you have a, if you can see one that has your, yeah. Okay, is that looking any better? It says I'm screen sharing. Yeah. Do you have the one with your PowerPoint open? I do, yep. I'm going to okay. open that right now. 
Right. So I made progress, right? All right. We are seeing it, Major. This is good. <laughs> yeah. All right. You built so, the anticipation, which is what we needed. Good. Well, I apologize to everyone. I'm glad it didn't take more than a, a couple of minutes. Uh, but uh, now I'm, I'm where I want it to be. And uh, so uh, as, I, as I left you off, uh, I talked about uh, what I'll do at the end is to um, kind of give you a sense of today's business and also uh, take some time to answer questions. And so what we're gonna talk about, it, it's really interesting if you think about sustaining the coffee industry uh, because you, you immediately think about whose job is that? And uh, I've already told you that uh, I think that we all have that ultimate responsibility. And uh, that is a grand one, but it really is the same responsibility that we have when we, when we have an interest in anything anything that we buy. Uh, we, uh, there's an implied uh, validation for uh, the efforts that vendors are making whenever we give them our money. And I think it's really important to understand that although we might turn around and say it's their responsibility, but we, we validate it when we give them anything, especially when we give them our money. And so, in order to really set the stage, uh, I wanna take you back to the late 1960s. And I want to take off my kind of coffee hat and become your history teacher for a few minutes so that I can set the stage for you and have you understand the business. And so I'm going to take you back to the time when coffee was terrible. I talked about the abysmal coffee that I had when I was a student at RIT. I can tell you that when I was a teacher at Beaver Country Day School, the coffee was even worse. And something interesting happens in the late 1960s that is going to change the world of coffee uh, and really build the world that we all are part of. And it's the responsibility uh, at that time was taken by a guy who is a name that will be familiar to many of you. His name was Alfred Pete. And Alfred Pete was a young entrepreneur in the Bay Area in California, outside of San Francisco. And uh, he had some money, he had no job, and he recognized something that few had recognized, which was that this thing called coffee that people were drinking that was quite horrible, there was another side to it that was not horrible at all. In fact, it was incredibly delicious. And Alfred decided to start a business in which he would roast coffee, carrying a heritage that his dad had had in Europe when he was a boy growing up. And he began roasting coffee for Pete's Coffee and Tea. And there was only one incentive that Alfred had at that time to start his business. One thing that was important to him. And that was that he was going to change the game when it came to quality. The idea of providing customers with a coffee that was of the highest quality was the number one priority. It was the most important thing. Whatever he was gonna do, that coffee was gonna be incredibly, incredibly tasty. Now, I have to be honest with you, at this point, if I had three hours, I would take you on a journey around the world because coffee didn't come from Berkeley, it didn't come from California, it came from places that are remote and quite exotic. And uh, I wish, I wish that I had the time to kind of take you on that path, but, this priority that Alfred had is quickly going to become clouded. And the reason it's going to become clouded is because Alfred had uh, a, good, a good heart, a good soul. He was, uh, he was an immensely ethical, cranky guy. Uh, I had a chance. I had a chance to have coffee with him uh, in, in my early years at Starbucks 
when I had first moved to Seattle and uh, spent hours with him talking about coffee. It was clear that quality was his, was his driver. But something that he encountered troubled him and it changed the way that he was going to do business because he was delivering dollars to these far reaching places and he was less than secure in the knowledge that those dollars were going to the people who were doing the work to get him the coffee. What he realized in the beginning of his business was that the money was not necessarily getting to the right people. And so the finances of coffee became immensely important to him. And really there's very little he can do. You have to imagine he's a young entrepreneur with one, with one coffee roasting business who was doing the best he could to influence and find the best quality coffee and then influence the people who he was getting it from. But it, there's very little power at that time. But he began to think about ways that one might be able to change the way that the money transacted. Then something else happens because he has a heart and because his efforts have now led in the first three years to the beginning of a business that is expanding. Alfred out got started and almost a year, two years later, three guys in Seattle, Zeb Siegel, Gordon Bulker, and Jerry Baldwin decided to start a small company in Pike Place Market in Seattle. On the East Coast, a guy whose name is George Howell decided to start a company called The Coffee Connection. He started in Harvard Square with one shop in a crazy mall that was called The Garage. And in New York, Familiar name to many of you guys might be Zabar's, but the Zabar brothers also were beginning to get into coffee. And so what happened was that this small movement of people who were so focused on quality were also beginning to spend a little more money and they were realizing that they were beginning to have power in terms of the finances. But something else happens that again, is going to be instrumental in changing the business that exists today. And that is they began to enjoy relationships with the people who they were transacting with to get coffee, especially relationships at the origin source, the people who were farming and the people who were processing the coffee. And if, I, I don't want to confuse you in any way, but understand that in the business, there are many people who farm coffee, they grow the actual fruit, but many of those growers don't have the capacity to change the fruit into a seed, which is what needs to go to a roaster. And so when I refer to processors, understand that there's a step that comes after growers that often exists and it's called the processor. And so what happens in the coffee business is that it's an annual crop, it's cyclical. You get a crop each year and you pray that the next year's crop will be amazing. And by nature of the business, what that means is that the people who are buying your coffee are gonna come back. If they liked your coffee one year, they're going to want to come back. And so something happens that happens to all of us. Think about when you moved into a neighborhood the last time and you began to meet the merchants in your new neighborhood and you got on well with some of them. You got to meet them and you got to meet their family and you realized that you were going to go back and you were beginning to build a relationship with them. In the, in the coffee business, that relationship is huge because you want to be able to go back, you want to be able to return. Inherent in that relationship building is going to be an interest in the lives of the people beyond the transaction. 
And that happens in the coffee business in the early 1970s. The people who were going to buy the coffee, Alfred Peet was going, a guy from Starbucks named Dave Olson, a woman from Starbucks named Mary Williams. They were going into countries each year and they were beginning to enjoy relationships with not only the farmer or not only the processor, but also they got to know their, the grandparents and the children. And they enjoyed those relationships and they realized something. They realized that the, the, the life conditions, the social conditions of the people that they were buying coffee from were not as, were not as privileged as theirs. And they wondered, they wondered in those early days, is there something that they could do in order to be part, to make a contribution beyond the dollars they were giving to those social conditions? And then if, you're, if your mind is moving in the right place here and you're thinking about the other things that are important with coffee, then the last of these four important, important considerations is probably already in your mind. And it has to do with the environment because coffee is an agricultural product that is coming from a fruit on a tree and processors go after the seed of that fruit and they prepare it and that seed is what ends up in the hands of the roaster and so if if this fruit on a tree which is stuck in the face of the earth is is your product then the things that have to do with the environment are going to be immensely important and so what I have just really done for you is to build you a picture of what happens in the business as the early years go on, you, you understand that these four elements, this idea of quality was absolutely the most important. If you don't have quality, then you really have no reason to spend your money or care about the social conditions or the environmental conditions. But beyond quality, those financial considerations, social conditions, and environmental concerns are going to be immensely important then, and they're immensely important now. Begin to think about your own coffee experience. And this really, uh, this quote that I pulled today from uh, Coffee Talk magazine which is highlighting a, a, an issue that they've got that's coming up. This idea of this shared commitment, they imply the commitment is really a shared commitment uh, in the industry. I've already shared with you that I believe that the commitment is ours, that we are the ones who can leverage the most power because we're the ones going. And the first example that I wanna give you is Camber Coffee. I'm guessing that most of you have never heard of Camber coffee. This morning, I enjoyed an incredibly delicious brewed cup of Camber coffee, finished up a bag that was actually uh, roasted and sold in support of uh, the largest research organization in the coffee industry today. A good portion of the portions, uh, the, the good portion of the, um, the money that they're getting for the coffee from Camber. But Camber is absolutely tiny. It's a very small coffee company, probably known mostly to only Pacific Northwesters. But on the bag of coffee that I got were the statements, goodness of coffee, okay, what is important to them, how good it tastes. Now think back, that goes back to our quality. How good is it for the planet and how good is it for the people? That becomes the mantra of their approach. And everything that they're doing is really focused on this idea of goodness of coffee, which always leads with the taste. I can't emphasize that enough. That is the most important thing because no one who's listening here, none of you guys who are joining us tonight is interested if the coffee isn't tasting good. It has to get past that threshold. And then this whole world opens up. The next coffee company that I, I wanna share with you is in Arkansas. Again, you might have heard of this one, and the reason you might have heard of it is because the, um, the team that owns it, uh, Andrea Allen and her husband, um, she's the current 
United States barista champion. But I would tell you that Onyx in Arkansas with three or four outlets has become one of the most important coffee companies in the world, certainly because Andrea has won the championship, but also because they are, they are currently as a company buying in the thousands of pounds of coffee, doing some things which are supporting the customer and what the customer might want to know. But turn that around, I would tell you that they're helping educate, just as, as what we're doing today is, is helping you guys all have a different viewpoint about coffee. What they're doing is helping educate the customer to understand what they might want to be interested in, in terms of the things that are important in coffee beyond that great taste. And so you see that they're talking about transparency, they're talking about accountability. And interestingly, I know it's hard to see, but this idea of transparency, I've kind of translated it for you all here because I wanted you to understand that Onyx has really based a lot of their goodness around the price. And you can see the elements that go into the price and those elements are listed there. And those are the, the things that cause the coffee to be more or less valuable. Now, again, Onyx is, is pretty much unknown. And so you've seen a small company and you've seen a medium sized company. And the company that I worked for, for 25 and a half years, has perhaps the toughest time because it's so big. Starbucks is so big today. But I, I, I'm gonna share with you some of the details of what they can do. And I, I wanna plant a seed because I often say to people who ask me, where should I go to get coffee? And I, I very much will do just what I'm doing with all of you to talk about, these are the things that you should think about. And what I often try to emphasize is that whoever you give your money to, you should have a sense about what it is they're doing with that money beyond getting you a great tasting cup of coffee and ask questions, dig in and get the details. Now, I have always loved the simplicity of Starbucks approach because they try to make that clean link for us from what they're doing and the success of the farmers, because they understand that sustaining our industry is really dependent on helping eliminate the, the risks and the obstacles that farmers are encountering, encountering. What you're seeing here in this circle are all of the elements for pieces that are part of a full approach and I'll give you a little bit about each of them just so you can understand that upper left is the most important, which is the approach which was started in the 1990s. And really what I did for you with quality, with finances, with social and environmental conditions was all grounded in the earliest days of cafe practices. That's the approach. Starbucks has been trying to give away coffee trees Starbucks has built some farmer support centers which house agronomists so that we have financial things that are that are being done to support uh, to support the industry by way of scientific advancements so that more coffee can be grown that is more abundant in crop and less susceptible to diseases and pests. The Starbucks Foundation, has worked directly to empower women, particularly women in coffee countries. The Global Farmer Fund is an answer to the financial difficulties that farmers have because they work on a cyclical crop cycle. They get money when they sell their coffee and by the time it's 360 days later, they don't have any money. And so being able to access financing is hugely important to them. And then 
This bottom left one, I'm gonna spend some time on in the end, something called the Sustainable Coffee Challenge. It's not only Starbucks, it's actually industry-wide. This is another way to think about it. Uh, Starbucks has had a relationship with Conservation International uh, and some of the other elements that I spoke about are listed here. And what, what you begin to get a full recognition of here is that, is that Starbucks has been more successful and has grown bigger. And what they've done is amplified their involvement consistent with the success that they've had. It's one of the reasons that I, that I believe in, in what they're doing. And I was able to be a proud partner. Partner is what they call employees for 25 and a half years. This is another way of thinking, this is their cafe practices, but you see where I got the original information that I shared with you. Uh, it really came from cafe practices. The things that are important when you are approaching coffee and you wanna ask questions of the people who are providing you with coffee, where do you go? What do you want to be asking them about? Now, this is a mind-blowing slide. Probably you're looking at brands that you recognize, institutions that you recognize, and uh, this is really the very beginning of what I think is the most important effort in sustainability, and Starbucks is part of it, with Conservation International and the efforts are to make coffee the world's first sustainable agricultural product. It's a huge, huge task and, and it still remains to be seen whether it can happen. But this, this is the game changer that needs to happen in the industry in order for this idea of sustainability to actually be realized because the risks right now are huge. Uh, I'll take a quick side trip and I'll tell you that a good friend of mine uh, is an author uh, and uh, he's written a book called Uncommon Grounds. Uh, and uh, when he speaks in front of a group, he often leads his presentation by saying, how fortunate we are as coffee drinkers that we've enjoyed this very inexpensive luxury and that we should be paying much more for what we're enjoying because uh, it's far more precious than its early days as a commodity have led us to believe and, uh, and we should treasure it. Uh, I have often thought as I've gotten kind of on and, and spent so many years in coffee that I hope, I hope that we're not in the heyday in the finest hours of coffee and that it's, it's potentially downhill from here. Are we gonna be able to get all this great coffee that we enjoy uh, and still pay a reasonable price? And so uh, not to be gloom and doom, but I think this effort, this sustainable coffee challenge is, is one of those things that's gonna help us um, perhaps ensure that that future is, uh, is sustained. I wanted to include this today because what I've done thus far, giving you a sense of the history that leads us into those four things, and also uh, the kind of state of the industry today, uh, this is a brand new diagram that was just introduced as part of the work that an organization that I, uh, that I, I'm a member of and think very highly of the Specialty Coffee Association, which supports the whole industry. And, and what, they, what they have been trying to do as everyone is approaching sustainability is to think about what are the systems that are in play that are essential for one to look at when you're thinking about honing in on some part of the coffee world to see where you might be able to impact a difference, a change. And so we're all, we're all here. Uh, I don't think any farmers or processes, or exporter, importers, maybe roasters out there, but we're in the brewing one. That's us. That's us because people are brewing coffee for us and we're brewing coffee. But as you, as you kind of dive in 
and learn more about coffee, I would I would reflect on this on this chart. You can get it from the SCA. It's it's available. I'd be happy to send to anyone who wants one a copy. It's crazy when you think about how in, intertwined all of these elements are. But those are those are today's world of coffee. And as you dig in and think about sustainability, each of those offers opportunities for a brighter future if if the right efforts are made um, by people who are taking responsibility for those areas, for those disciplines. So I'm gonna kind of begin to finish up because I want to leave time for question, but I wanted to, I wanted to reinforce for you guys the, the two organizations that I've mentioned, uh, the two efforts, if you will, the other organization and effort that I've mentioned so that you'll have a, 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 you'll have a way to continue to stay tuned in on what is happening in sustainability and coffee and also uh, and be you'll take a part because you're probably going to have coffee tomorrow and you're going to think about those things that I talked about after you taste how delicious your coffee is um, those those other elements that I talked about the first is the specialty coffee association um, they are uh, they are really the overseeing organization for the whole industry that exists today they're a global organization and uh, any any interest that you have, you can satisfy with them. And then the Sustainable Coffee Challenge, which I spoke about, uh, I'm going to give you uh, here uh, my email uh, in the hopes that you will uh, feel free to, uh, to contact me uh, should we not answer a question that you have today or if there's a question that comes up uh, or if you just um, want to talk about coffee, um, then, then fire away and, and get in touch because I would love I would love to think of this um, this evening as a beginning uh, and uh, not a one-time experience. And then I, I would uh, ask Dan to jump back in. And uh, I know you had a question or two yourself, Dan, and uh, I'm open. Uh, I really hope that I have given you all something different to think about with coffee, uh, something to uh, enhance your own experience so that you feel as though uh, you're not just giving away what you could be uh, using to help make a more sustainable industry with this product that you're probably consuming more than once every single day. So, Dan, it's all yours. All right. Major, thank you so much for sharing that. I am fascinated, as I knew I would be. Uh, so we have gotten some great questions in the Q&A chat box, which for everyone, uh, you can still be sending those in as we start asking these. This may prompt you uh, to have more questions, so feel free to put those in. We're not putting a hard stop on those. Uh, so I am actually just going to start with a super easy question uh, that is something I'm personally interested in, which is just what is your favorite Starbucks roast? Wow. Okay. You know, that's always, that's always such a loaded question. I, a hard hitting I, one. <laughs> yeah. You know, my, I, I'm going to spin it a little bit. My favorite coffee is the coffee that I had today. Uh, and, and upstairs in my cabinet, I have, um, I have probably 12 brands of coffee mm. that I'm exploring right now. Starbucks fi figures significantly in those. When I first started drinking Starbucks coffee, I enjoyed dark roast and mm. Cafe Verona was my favorite coffee. Uh, and I still love a cup of Verona, but something interesting happened to me and something interesting happened in the industry. Um, and that is that the days of dark roast, which Alfred Pete and the Starbucks founders started, really left an opportunity for a whole new wave. And anybody who's followed this, story of coffee knows that that word I've picked significantly because wave is what this whole thing was called. There was the first wave, which was coffee. There was the second wave, which was Pete's and Starbucks. And then there was this thing called the third wave. And without getting into too much detail, understand that in the third wave, the entrepreneurs that started the third wave uh, 15 years ago looked at the business and they saw an opportunity. Starbucks and Pete's roasted dark coffee, and so they roasted lighter. That was the opportunity. Why would they go head to head? 
And so what that meant was that there was an awful lot of really good coffees that were coming into the market that were roasted lighter than Starbucks. And so for me, that I love coffee. So I began to sample those. And interestingly, Starbucks began to move a little lighter. And if you look at the years, the early, when I started at Starbucks, House Blend was the lightest coffee that was sold. It's a medium roast now, and it's actually a fairly dark medium roast. Then Starbucks added blonde coffees. Well, first they added breakfast blend and light note blend, which were a little bit lighter, but they weren't really light coffees. And then Starbucks added blonde roast. So there's another history lesson for you about the history of roasting in this specialty coffee business. But what that did for me was I began to enjoy the nuances that come in medium and light medium roasts more than dark roasts. And it isn't that I don't enjoy a dark roast, but I really treasure the, the characteristics that come through when, I, when coffee is not super dark. And I have to be honest, I don't like it when it's super light either. I find those to be, to be a little bit grassy and a little bit bitter, if you will. And so I kind of land in the middle a lot with my roasts. If I picked a Starbucks coffee right now, if you said, what do you want to have? And I could pick any one, I'd pick um, uh, Guatemala Antigua is one of my favorites. Um, I love the blonde espresso that Starbucks has right now. And uh, you already heard my day started off with Camber, uh, with Camber. And uh, I also, interestingly, I had, um, I had some Nespresso today because a friend of mine gave me an espresso machine and so um, oftentimes I make an espresso uh, in between my brewed coffee. So that's, that's one of my, and I like, the, I like the Nespresso capsules and I like the Starbucks capsules that are now branded, so. Wow, I never thought that I would like Nespresso, but then I was like, you can't keep me away from my pour over, but I actually found them, like you said, to be a nice like in-between thing. Well, uh, I'll tell you, Dan, I didn't want to like it. I, I didn't I, either. No, I encountered my first Nespresso in a hotel in uh, Shanghai. And the hotel gave me three capsules and a machine. And when I checked in and got into my room, I swore I wouldn't touch any of them. I was a Starbucks guy. I wasn't going to touch those things. And uh, I woke up in the middle of the night with jet lag and I had one. And I couldn't believe how good it tasted. And so I made the second one. And then I'll be honest, I even drank the decaf one because I liked them all so much. So, hey, I got it. We've all been there as long as it's not Keurig in my mind, but that's yeah. a whole nother conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of the flavors, we got an audience question that we had was how do they get or how can one get uh, the great Starbucks espresso flavor when making coffee at home? So. The key, for, the key for coffee at home is simple. And one of the, one of the tools that we, uh, that we often talked about in the early days when you're training baristas and uh, one that I, uh, I certainly included in, in my um, upcoming book is um, something that are called the four fundamentals at Starbucks, okay? And uh, one of the little tricks that we had uh, to remember the fundamentals was please go with the fundamentals. Please go with the fundamentals. This first one is proportion. So you have to have a recipe. And I can tell you that Starbucks and all coffee shops are religious with their recipes. You have to have a consistent recipe. So that's your P. And then G, hugely important, is grinding. So you have to make sure that the coffee is appropriately ground for the brewing method you're going to use. You can, you can vary it a little bit this way and that way, but you can't go too far because if you don't grind it right, there's no way you're going to get extraction. And then this W, water. So water is hugely, hugely important because water is more than 98% of your cup of coffee. The rule of thumb is if you will drink your water at home. If you don't mind having a glass of water at home and it doesn't have any taste, then you can use it to brew. But if you don't drink your water at home because it tastes bad, that bad taste is going right into your coffee so you can't brew with it. So please go with the fundamentals 
okay? This last one is freshness. Coffee is a fresh food product. And so when it's green, when it hasn't been roasted, which probably no one on the call has, you have a lot of time you can hold it. But once it's roasted, a clock starts ticking and the coffee begins to get stale almost immediately after you roast it. Now, it isn't like you should drink it the next day because there's something that happens with it that you actually can't drink it the next day because it won't taste as good. But as soon as it gives off enough carbon dioxide, something that is called degassing, as soon as it gives off enough, which is usually uh, five days, six days, then it hits its peak. And after that peak, it's all downhill. And uh, after maybe seven days, 10 days, it's not gonna be as good as it would be. So proportion, grind, water, and freshness are your key to making a great cup of coffee. This is fantastic. <laughs> I feel like we could go all night talking. This is yeah, amazing. well, we could. I, I, you know, I, know. I do, I, you know what, so. <laughs> uh, all right, well, since the interpreters are not here all night, let, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, someone had asked, with the huge increase in demand for coffee, has agrochemical and agricultural biotechnology had an impact on the industry? Not being an expert in either of those, I, I don't want to sound as though I'm an expert, but I would, I would say that science has definitely had a significant presence in growing more, better coffee. I spoke briefly about the agronomists that, that are working for Starbucks. And there are agronomists working in coffee. Every coffee company almost has one now. And I think that they, they're doing some amazing things. The, one of the things, and, and I don't know if, if those two agros that you shared imply, I don't know anything about them. So I, I don't understand what they mean. But what I know in coffee today is that there are significant pressures that are being presented by both climate change and the peripheral effect of climate change. And what I mean by that is something that you can research and read about today that is one of the most pressing problems is something called leaf rust, leaf rust. Roya. And leaf rust is an airborne fungus. And if it, if it gets on a coffee tree, it prevents the coffee tree from photosynthesis, photosynthesis. And with no photosynthesis, the coffee tree dies. And so it's been in the industry, it's been a problem in the industry for many, many years. But what's happening as the, as the warming is, is occurring on mountainsides all through the coffee belt, this belt between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn where coffee is growing in mountainous areas, in Latin America and Central America, in Africa, in the Arabian Peninsula and around to the Asia Pacific, the places that coffee is growing. That leaf rust is becoming more and more of a problem. And so what's going on right now that is the most significant scientific research work is to find coffee that is resistant to Roya. And the way that that's done is amazing, Daniel. They basically, they grow a bunch of coffee, which is, is good. And they carefully select the best from a growing area where the coffee is, is good. And then they plant the best from that selection into the next year. And each year they get success, successively better coffee. And it, if, if they've found a tree that is resistant to rust and you grow it over the course of 10, in fact, there's an agronomist working in Sumatra who I spent some time with there who has 30 years of selective growth. They make a tree that is actually yielding cherry that is resistant to Roya. 
you saw on the slide that I shared about Starbucks giving away coffee trees. Those trees are the result of this work. And, and so what's happening in many, many countries today where Starbucks is buying coffee is that Starbucks is giving trees that are more resistant to Roya, grow more coffee. In some cases, they don't grow as tall. They grow bushier with better coffee. And, and that's the kind of advancement that's happening all over the industry today because it's crucial. The, it's like the, the waves are coming more and more close that are threatening and the industry has to keep pushing back. And what is that? That's sustainability. The industry wants to sustain the business. And so from an agricultural perspective, that's the kind of work that's going on today. That is fascinating. Um, someone asked if you think that Jamaican Blue Mountain coffee is really worth the price? No, nope. I, I have right. to, you know, I'm going to say no, but I, I have to, I, you know, I, I have to look like I know what I'm talking about. So I have to give you a little more information. I, I you know, I've had some amazing Jamaica Blue Mountain. Um, we had a couple while I was working at Starbucks. I've had some others that were really, really um, quite special and, uh, and well worth whatever whatever someone paid or I paid for them. Um, generally, they have seen their heyday in a time when there were far less amazing coffees available. And so the Jamaican government did an incredible job at marketing what was in its day, the most special coffee, short of perhaps Hawaiian coffees, Jamaican coffees were among the world's most premium. They are still a small part of some of the best high premium coffees, but generally they're, you, you have to be cautious about just following the name. Uh, and you know, I, I would say we're talking about something to taste. I, I based almost my entire early comments on this idea of making sure that it was quality and that we like the taste. That's the most important thing. So just like anything else, you can't, you can't buy it based on the name. You can try it based on the name and then you have to be the judge. Hmm. Uh, someone has asked if you have explored the Starbucks Reserve Roastery um, and if you're familiar with any types of roasteries available to consumers that aren't Starbucks. Yeah, you know, it, I, I know it, it, here's something I'm super proud of. I, I helped build the first roastery in Seattle uh, and I, I operated a uh, test store in Seattle for Starbucks that was a secret store, not named Starbucks. And, and the work that we did in that store with the team that I had and with the executives that I worked with actually leads Starbucks to the roastery. And I've been in all of the roasteries except for uh, Milan and Chicago. Chicago opened uh, and then uh, closed because of COVID. Uh, I haven't been to Milan, but I, I spent time in, and did training sessions in, in all of the other roasteries and they are spectacular. Um, it's, it, the opportunity, it's, it's quite special. I mean, they're the fanciest Starbucks, but I'll tell you that the thing that the roasteries afford a customer is an opportunity to see the entire roasting process and to engage with the, with the roasters, the people who roast the coffee and to talk with them and to understand this craft which is so important in the business and that craft is roasting coffee. It would seem easy. One would think that it would be simple to roast coffee. You take a green seed and you turn it brown. But I'll tell you that, that it's, it's an art and a science and, uh, and there are few companies that can do it consistently uh, as well as Starbucks or for as long as Starbucks. Um, there are roasters virtually there are roasters in every city now. And so anyone who's interested in roasting, I'll tell you something interesting about the industry. It's a very welcoming fraternity, sorority of humans, very welcoming. And as much as even people who compete are always open. 
So I would recommend to anyone in the audience, if there's a company whose coffee they are enjoying and that coffee is being roasted in the city that they live in, I would call up the company and say, I'd like to see your roasting plant. And I would be willing to wager that there's a very good likelihood that, they, that with that interest, they may not be open to the public, but with that interest and the initiative of that phone call, I would be so surprised if they didn't say, come on down, we'd love to show you how we roast coffee. And, uh, and I, I would feel comfortable saying that in any city in the United States right now, because there's so much great coffee being roasted. Well, it is on my bucket list to check out the Starbucks ones, but I love that yeah. uh, thought of trying out local ones because I know even in Rochester, uh, they do have those. Yeah, where um, did I go? It's Joe, Joe Bar in the market, public market. There's a coffee shop uh, that I went to. Uh, it's Joe, is it Joe's Coffee? It's in the public market. It's, uh, it's right across from, the, um, from where, they st uh, where the stalls are. Oh. And, see, and they have a roaster right in there. I am pretty new to Rochester, so this oh, okay. is next to me. And uh, I, spent, I, spent a, I, I spent a half a day there talking yeah. to the guy roasting coffee, yeah. That's amazing. Well, we are reaching, uh, we're a little over time, so I just want to ask our final two questions and then wrap okay. things up. Uh, okay. The first one is pretty simple of just the best home grinder to use, and if you yep. recommend, what you recommend for brewing coffee, whether it's pour over, drip brew, what Great. would you suggest? Yeah, I, I have two grinders that, that are at my house. And uh, it's so, I'm so excited because these questions, I, I wrote about all these questions in my book. So I can't wait for my book to come out because I think I wrote about the right stuff. I have two grinders. One of them is a hand grinder. It's called the Lido 2, L-I-D-O 2, Roman numeral or not Roman numeral, but two. Um, and it's a wonderful hand grinder. There's some great hand grinders available right now. Um, and I love this Lido two grinder from Orphan Espresso. And then I just got a brand new grinder, which is the most amazing grinder. It just came on the market. It's, um, it's called the Ode, O-D-E, Ode grinder. Uh, it's made by Fellow, F-E-L-L-O-W. And it's, it's a fantastic home grinder for coffee brewing. And then the grinder that I recommend if you have an espresso machine is an industry respected grinder called the Barazza. Barazza, it's, um, it's a Seattle company. Um, they make a great grinder. Um, and uh, I, I grind coffee every morning for my brew. And my favorite way to brew is, uh, is with a Chemex, which is the brewer that's like an hourglass glass. And uh, I don't use a paper filter. I use a metal filter, which is, um, which is called an Abel, Abel cone filter, A-B-L-E. And uh, I don't like the use of paper. I don't like you have to rinse the paper. And I, uh, I love this Abel cone. Uh, and I make, I make a Chemex for myself uh, every, uh, every morning. Uh, if there's really any aficionados out there, I use a one to 15 recipe, one part coffee to 15 parts water. Um, it takes me four minutes and 15 seconds to brew 555 grams of coffee, which is what I do every single day. And I, I would tell you, I talked about the recipe and my please go with the fundamentals. And okay, I use exactly the same procedure as close as I can at five in the morning, every single time I brew. And the only time I make a change is if I wanna try to impact the result. If I wanna try to make it a little stronger or a little bit less strong, I know how to play with it now because I brewed, God, I brewed a lot of coffee in my day. So, uh, but that's my favorite way to brew. And, uh, and again, I, I, I put my email on there and I'm not, I, I, I'm, I'm being completely candid and honest with all of you who are listening. I'm so appreciative. I'm so sad that I didn't get to meet you all in person and have coffee with you all. And I hope that if you do have a question or something that you want to share with me, use my email, please get in touch um, and uh, leave tonight with my, uh, with my utmost respect and, and gratitude for spending time, uh, 60 minutes with me to enjoy coffee, if you will. 
I was going to say, I'm grateful that you uh, put your email on there because I will be reaching out to get that list. Good. All right. Good. So our last question, uh, just wrapping things up right now is if you've heard of any companies growing coffee indoors in the United States. I have not. I, I'm growing coffee upstairs in my house. Uh, I have coffee plants. Uh, I've always been growing plants. Whenever I had access to cherries, I took the seeds, I put them in dirt and I, they make a great house plant, but you can't, I'm not going to make a living on the coffee that I'm growing in my house. So um, I don't know of anybody growing indoors uh, because it's, it's, I, I don't think it's a viable business at this point. Um, you'd need a lot of land and you'd need, um, you'd need a lot of indoors, but, uh, but if you want to try a coffee plant and you're curious, then let me know offline and I'll, I'll try to help you uh, with that because uh, it is fun to grow as a house plant. Yeah, I was gonna say, maybe that's something some RIT students or alumni can uh, work yep. out if anyone can. Yep. Uh, all right, Major, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with our alumni and friends today. Uh, and thank you to everyone who joined at this presentation. As mentioned earlier, we're gonna be sharing some information on how to access tonight's recorded presentation. And uh, if you're not connected to the RIT Alumni Association social media channels, we encourage you to do so. We're going to drop those links right down in the chat box. Uh, thank you again for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the rest of um, Tiger Alumni Week. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks again, Daniel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Major.